Hi, I'm here at uh, the Saybrook Graduate School of Psychology in San Francisco, and today we're going to talk about ayahuasca, which is variously called the uh, wine of the souls in South America or the magic drink of the Amazon. And here to talk with us about this is uh, one of the professors here, Dr. Stanley Krippner. And Dr. Krippner has traveled the world exploring different states of consciousness. The intent of this program is not to romanticize ayahuasca or to encourage anyone to take it. It is merely to bring to public awareness what ayahuasca is and what it is not. So with that in mind, Dr. Krippner is waiting for us in the uh, Rolla May Library here. Dr. Krippner, what motivated your interest in ayahuasca? Well, back in the early 1960s, I became very much interested in the whole topic of mind-altering chemicals that produce visionary experiences. And I had an experience with psilocybin as part of the Harvard University Research Project, while it was still legal. And then that led me to read about other substances, such as mescaline, psilocybin, and their natural foundations in the cacti and the mushrooms. And in that reading, I ran across this very curious book, um, The Yahe Papers, in which Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs were sharing stories about how they had found Yahe, or ayahuasca, in the Brazilian rainforest, and they were sharing experiences. Not long after that, I actually met Allen Ginsberg, and he showed up at a symposium on parapsychology, where J.B. Ryan, the founder of experimental parapsychology, was speaking. This was in New York City. And he came running up to J.B. Ryan and said, you really should investigate Yahe, also known as ayahuasca, because I've had some marvelous telepathic experiences. And Dr. Ryan listened to him very carefully. I knew that he was not in the position to do anything about it. So I went up and talked with Ginsburg. And so after that, the two of us became casual friends. We didn't spend considerable time together, but I did see him on and off in New York. He never lost his interest in Yahe, which is another name for ayahuasca. And it caused me to do reading, more reading about it. How have you followed through with that interest through the years? I was in Brazil with a group of people that I was taking on a trip courtesy of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And one of the offerings that was possible for the people who were visiting healers was an evening with an ayahuasca session. Now, as the tour guide, I said, I don't think it's appropriate for me to take ayahuasca unless everybody takes it. And of course, there were some people who were holding back, so I just spent the evening with them at a uh, folk dance instead of the ayahuasca. But everybody who went through that session was very pleased. They all got something out of it. The following year, I went back again with another group this time, everybody wanted to take it. This time, the um, church was in the environs of Rio de Janeiro. So that was my first experience with ayahuasca itself. And it had a remarkably calming effect upon me. Different people had different reactions. And it was in a religious setting with a whole group of Santo Daime, members. This is one of the three ayahuasca churches. And so whenever I've been in Brazil and have had the invitation from a legitimate church, I have had the opportunity to try it again. The three ayahuasca sacrament churches are Santo Daime, Give Me Health, Uniao to the Vegetal, Vegetables Coming Together, and Barquinha, Little Boat two of which now have come to the United States, and they have gotten um, legal permission to use ayahuasca as a sacrament in their particular churches. Did they get this from the Supreme Court? 
Uniel de Vegetal got it from the Supreme Court. Very recently, the Santo Daime group got it from a circuit court which covers most of the Southwest United States. And I think that uh, that's really all the permission that they will need. So for all extents and purposes, the ayahuasca churches are now using ayahuasca as a sacrament legally in the United States. And of course the prosecution was saying that people will become psychotic, it will run out into the streets, children will be taking it. No, none of that happened. Ayahuasca is really not the type of substance that you take casually or that you take on the street. It's just too powerful and for many people too disagreeable. They throw up, they vomit, they can't really stomach the substance right. too easily. So the question that I would ask at this point is, why add a religious structure to what a plant drink brings naturally? I think that that's a good question. The effects of ayahuasca are so profound and they are so intense that if they're not taken within a structure, especially a spiritual structure, people might become confused. They might not know what to do with all of these images. The shamans in Brazil who have been using ayahuasca, yahe, hawasca, uh, vine of the souls, whatever name it is given, they've been using it for over a thousand years, always in a structured setting. They knew that you just couldn't allow this to run amok and for people to take it on its own. How do people benefit from taking ayahuasca? In the churches, they benefit in this way. Each person has his or her own vision because it really evokes a lot of uh, information from the visual cortex. And these visions often have spiritual significance to them. And either on their own or with the help of a shaman or with the help of the community, they find meaning for their own personal life just like people will have a dream. Many people will make sense of the dream themselves, others will go to a psychotherapist or a dream group to drive meaning from the dream with all of its symbolism and all of its metaphors. In fact, the founders of these ayahuasca churches, two of the three of them, were rubber tappers. And the Indians introduced ayahuasca to them and they said, well, this is like Indian movies. The Indians don't have to go to a theater to see the movie, they just take this ayahuasca. Both of these individuals had visions of um, creatures of the forest. One had a green lady of the forest and she said, you must uh, bring this to more people and form a church around it. And he later thought she might have been the Madonna and attributed great religious significance because his background was Roman Catholicism. Well, this is not exactly mainstream Catholic doctrine. And so eventually it became a syncretic church, pulling together from Christianity, pulling together from the African Brazilian religions, pulling together from the Native American traditions. Mm -hmm. Ayahuasca produces visions of creatures and objects indigenous to where the plant grows. And even if it is ingested in other places, these images come up. How is it possible to have visions of what one has never seen? You see, I would doubt that. I would like to see experimental data indicating a person is having visions of what one has not seen in the movies, in books, in television, or in their imagination. I have heard this also, but I say, where is the beef? So I'm not going to take that statement literally until I actually have some verification of it. Okay. But I don't think that's important. I think that what is important is that, of course, when somebody takes a psychoactive drug, be it LSD or Yahe or ayahuasca, there are three factors at work, substance, set, and setting. The substance is the plant or the drug itself. The setting is the way that the uh, 
um, ambiance influences what's going to happen. And then the set is the individual's readiness, the psychology of the individual and what they expect from the experience. Now, if they expect that they're going to see snakes and jungle animals, well, then they're going to see snakes and jungle animals. And so even though they might be taking the drug in the Netherlands, where there's a very active group, and maybe they've never seen an anaconda in the Netherlands, not even in a zoo, they've seen movies about them, they've heard about them, so yes, they see an anaconda and say, how could I have imagined this um, and had this experience? I've never seen a real life anaconda. Well, yes, they have seen the movies about them, they've read about them, they have a set that they expect to see something like that. So you would say this might be a projection on their part? Sure. Of some kind? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here's another question. Uh, some people, after taking ayahuasca, feel as if their ego had dissolved. Boundaries vanish. We experience oneness. And uh, we might be able to see how we are from another point of view that is not our own. Um, the spirit of the plant seems to know us better than we could know ourselves. Now these are some statements that uh, people consider to be real. Can you, do these resonate at all with you? This is the same type of statement that you hear from people who have taken LSD, mm -hmm. who have gone into meditation, who have prayed for several hours, who have had mystical experiences out in the desert or in the forest or in the mountains. This is a feeling of oneness where one loses one's self-identity and what's happening in the brain is that the cerebral cortex where we have the neurological connections that give us our sense of self are temporarily suspended and we go more into the lower brain which is more highly emotional, where the images come up that have very little to do with our sense of individual identity. And I think that uh, this is not only characteristic of ayahuasca. We have a whole new branch now in the neurosciences called neurotheology, where the brain changes that take place during mystical experiences can be charted and can be understood. Now that doesn't mean that these experiences are not real. Of course they're real to the person and they can be put to very productive uses and very um, life enhancing uses. Nevertheless, we're now understanding more and more about the brain changes in which these experiences are grounded. Mm -hmm. I heard you in an interview another interview, and you said, ayahuasca is a brutal teacher. <laughs> Can you tell us uh, how you have found ayahuasca to be a brutal or a severe or a very direct teacher? This is not only my experience, this is something that you hear from many, many other people. Ayahuasca does seem to have a teaching function, but again, you enter the experience expecting to be taught because this is the reputation that it has. And because the drug is so overwhelming, because it produces such a volley of images, and because the effect upon the digestive system can be so disruptive, which accounts for so many people having nausea or throwing up in the early stages of the experience, it, uh, it is brutal. It's, comparable to having a teacher pound something into you or a Zen master whacking at you with a stick or if you fall asleep during mass the priest comes and knocks you on the shoulder with a wooden pallet. Right. Yeah, right. these are teaching techniques that are comparable to what ayahuasca gives you. Right. Ayahuasca is also called La Purga because as you said many people vomit uh, after taking it. but. There's something peculiar about the purging, the vomiting in ayahuasca because it is considered, I think, part of the healing process. Can you talk to us about this? Well, yes, I think that this is all a matter of reframing. This goes back dozens of years. I used to take people on their first LSD experiences and was the guide. 
And whenever anybody threw up, I said, all right, you're throwing up. I always had a pail handy or a bathroom handy. And I said, this is purging. This is getting all of the negative stuff out of your system, knowing very well that this was a reframing. This was an explanation for something that made something negative into something very positive. And it worked. It worked all the time. It worked beautifully. I think that's what's happening in ayahuasca. Many people's digestive systems just aren't used to the types of chemicals that ayahuasca contains. And also ayahuasca makes people very sensitive to their inner bodies and their digestive tract. And Americans are not very embodied. They don't do very much with martial arts. They don't do much with exercise. They don't do much with uh, inner alchemy, meditation. So they feel something in their body and they think it must be a sickness, it must be a stomachache, it must be strange, and so they go ahead and throw up. So this is a nice way of explaining that and saying, well, you're going to get the poisons out of your system. Oh, well, then it's okay that I throw up. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a very clever way of making something negative into something positive as far as I'm concerned. Okay. I think it was you who said something to the effect that it is difficult to take a psychedelic and integrate it into one's life in a society which is hostile to it and to a great degree ignorant of it. So um, let's say one has taken this and has uh, feels the need to change. But why is there a conflict between what a person has experienced inwardly and the society in which he lives? I think that this is often the result of people who get insights through prayer, through meditation, through ayahuasca, through whatever. And the insights are somewhat divergent from what they run across in the culture. One time when I took ayahuasca, I had this huge snake telling me that uh, I really had to be less resentful and forgive people who had done me wrong in the past and be more forgiving. Was this a new idea for you? Was this in, was this no, I've gotten the same idea through spiritual books like The Course in Miracles, but I have to keep reminding myself of it. I have to keep working on it. Okay. And so, uh, so I redoubled my efforts, you know, I redoubled my efforts and monitored myself to bring that into reality and just release it when somebody uh, says or does something that's pretty immature and pretty nasty toward me. Right. So. In our society, we do put a lot of stress upon revenge and uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and fighting back. This is not the message that you get from most of the ayahuasca sessions. Do you feel that there is an aversion to non-ordinary states of consciousness in this culture? I think there has been an emergence of non-ordinary states of consciousness for the last several decades. And many, many factors have brought this about. The introduction of meditation as a result of the work of Suzuki and Alan Watts, some of the early meditation teachers, and much more recently from the Maharishi Mahesh Yoga, and many Buddhist and Hindu teachers. Yes, this has had an enormous effect on people, generally for the best, not always for the best, but generally for the best as far as I'm concerned. Also, the influence of psychedelic drugs in the 1960s, and there I would say half and half, sometimes for the best, sometimes for the worst. Also, the emergence of retreats where people can go for contemplative prayer and can have silence, can sit and watch nature, or can read scripture, or can just enjoy the silence this is something that has taken an upturn in our society. And then we have the medical uses of altered states. We have the biofeedback, we have the visual imagery, we have psychotherapy that uses uh, holotropic breathing, that uses expressive art therapy. I think that the, the days when 
our rational, logical, waking state of consciousness is the only normal waking state of consciousness are pretty much over. I think that thoughtful people now realize that there could be a variety of alterations in consciousness that in the right time and in the right place can be very salubrious and very beneficial. Right. Let's talk a bit more about some of the positive uh, consequences you have witnessed from uh, ayahuasca use. I think, is it true that um, um, ayahuasca has the potential to uh, heal people from addictive behavior? There certainly are reports of this. There was a very rigorous study done by Charles Grobe from medical school at the University of California, Irvine, where he and his team went and studied members of Unial de Vegetal in Brazil. And first of all, he found that even with constant use, at least once a month, there were no negative consequences on the people's health, even for young people. But he also found numerous cases where people had gone to the church in an attempt to conquer their addictions and had succeeded. I think that uh, he has enough data on this to indicate that at least in Brazil, ayahuasca has been a very potent agent not by itself, but with community support, with indigenous psychotherapy, to help people work through and overcome addiction to cocaine, to heroin, to methamphetamines and other highly addictive drugs, also alcohol, which is you know a scourge in many of these native communities. Right. Are you saying that there are no negative consequences from taking ayahuasca? There are always negative consequences to anything that has positive consequences because you never know how a person is going to react. There are negative consequences to too much meditation. There are negative consequences to too much church going, especially if you go to a church that advocates uh, a lot of revenge and a lot of hatred and a lot of uh, uh, discrimination. There is um, bound to be negative effects of, with anything that's powerful. Now, I personally do not know of negative effects from ayahuasca use, but I did talk secondhand to somebody whose brother was taking ayahuasca several times a week and sort of lost his grasp on consensual reality and was, you know, too much in the other worlds. And on the advice of his family, he pulled back and really he had to stop taking it completely before he was able to enter into relationships again, hold a job again. In other words, the ayahuasca experience was not for him. He just got carried away and was too much of a good thing. And I'm sure that this happens occasionally. What do you see as the best future for uh, ayahuasca? I really think that there are two. In this day and age, where in the United States church membership is going down, for better or for worse, where people are dropping out of many organized religions, again, for better or for worse, there are two sides to this, the people who are dropping out often have no spiritual framework in which to make tough existential, ethical, and value decisions. So this might be the type of person for whom something like ayahuasca, which gives them a new mythology, which gives them a lived experience, something they've never gotten from their other religions, this might fill the bill and this might fill a void in their lives. I don't see the ayahuasca churches as ever becoming huge, powerful um, mass movements in the United States, at least not for the next hundred years. But I do see them as helping, shall we say, a group of people for whom this type of experience is very suitable. 
But I also see ayahuasca as having a potential therapeutic effect. Some, maybe 20 years ago, a pharmaceutical company actually came in and tried to take out a patent on ayahuasca. For this reason, they thought it could be used as a medicinal drug. Well, the indigenous people got together and signed a petition and raised all sorts of fuss about this until the pharmaceutical company backed off. They were getting bad public relations from this. If anybody's going to take a patent out on it, it should be in the indigenous people. But of course, their point of view is, no, we don't own this. This comes from the jungle. As most people down there know, ayahuasca actually comes from the combination of two plants. Very unusual combination. One plant holds down the serotonin in the brain, and the other plant provides the dimethyltryptamine that runs free now that the serotonin is out of the way. Now, of all the tens of thousands of plants in the rainforest, how did the Indians ever discover that these two plants and that combination could produce that effect? So if anybody gets a patent, they're the ones who discovered it. They're the ones who should right, have the patent right. on it. Last question. Uh, Dr. Pittman, you said that there is some kind of a spiritual component, there's the potential for a spiritual component to taking ayahuasca. How would you define the word spiritual to a person who has never heard of it before? Mm -hmm. I would have to differentiate spirituality from religion. Religion is easy to define. Religion is an institution. It's a body of believers. There is a creed that is more or less followed. There is usually a sacred book. There is an order of service. And there is a time and place for worship. Worship mainly of gods, sometimes of gods and goddesses, sometimes of spirits, but something above and beyond the ordinary reality. Now, spirituality does not have an institution. Obviously, somebody can be spiritual as well as religious, but more and more people in the United States are calling themselves spiritual and not religious because they are not members of a church. But they consider themselves spiritual because they still respect and venerate something larger than themselves, whether it's God, whether it's humanity, whether it is nature, whether it is the spiritual path, whether it's the Tao, doesn't matter. It's something that gives life a broader, deeper, higher context, something that helps them form a code of ethics, that gives them a sense of right and wrong, that allows them to find meaning in their lives. So spirituality is focused on existential concerns, finding meanings in one's life, creating one's own mythology rather than following the mythology of an organized religion. And frankly, I don't think people can live a happy life without this code, whether they be agnostics or atheists or theists or whatever. They need some way to make decisions when moral and ethical principles are involved. And that's what spirituality is all about. Dr. Krippner, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for such excellent questions. Thank you.